I want to talk about glomerular filtration, the formation of the glomerular filtrate in the renal corpuscles. So let's start with a diagram of the anatomy here. So here we have the afferent arteriole. And of course, as you probably know, there is a efferent arteriole as well. But the efferent arteriole tends to be a bit thinner than the afferent arteriole. And the afferent arteriole here is taking blood into the glomerulus, which is a ball of capillaries. And it's a complex ball of capillaries. So I'll just draw a few capillaries on here to make it simple. So here we have the capillaries in my glomerulus. So we have the blood in the afferent arteriole here, the blood in the capillaries of the glomerulus, going through the ball of capillaries, that is the glomerulus, and the blood leaving in the efferent arteriole. So let's just put a few labels on that so we remember what we're talking about. So this is afferent arterial. So the blood is going in via the afferent arterial. That means this afferent arterial is a branch of the renal artery. The blood is circulating through the capillaries of the glomerulus and it is leaving via the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial actually goes on to form the peritubular capillaries, as we'll see later. And this whole thing is surrounded by a capsule. And it goes on to a tube, which is the start of the nephron. So here we have the, this whole thing is the renal corpuscle. And this is the parietal capsule. It's made up of individual squamous cells. This is the capsule, of course, we call Bowman's capsule. So that goes round there the parietal layer. And this space between the capillaries and Bowman's capsule is Bowman's space, or the, the capsular space. The capsular space. Now, what's going on here is the process of ultrafiltration. It's filtration, but it's just on a microscopic scale. So in principle, it's exactly the same as you sieving some peas in your kitchen, but it's just going on, on a, in a microscopic scale. So the blood is coming in here. Now, first of all, let's think about how the glomerular filtrate is formed. Well, the pressure in the afferent arteriole is relatively high. And the pressure going into these capillaries is going to be about 55 millimetres of mercury. Now that's going to vary depending on which part of the glomerulus that you are considering. But it's going to be in that order. So that means if there's a hydrostatic pressure of 55 in the capillaries of the glomerulus, that is a hydrostatic pressure of 55 pushing water and filtrate out into Bowman space. And of course, once material is in Bowman space, it can go on down into the tubule onto the first or the proximal convoluted tubule. So pushing out, we've got this pressure, 55 millimeters of mercury, hydrostatic pressure. But as fluid accumulates in the capsular space, it's going to generate its own pressure. So at any one time, there's going to be a pressure in Bowman space, in this capsular space. And that pressure is going to be about 15 millimetres of mercury. 
So if there's a pressure of 15 millimeters of mercury here in the capsule of space, I think you can see that's opposing the hydrostatic pressure pushing out from the glomerular capillaries into the capsular space. So acting against that, there's going to be a pressure of 15 millimetres of mercury. And as well as that, there's going to be plasma proteins in the capillaries of the gemellulus. Now, because the plasma proteins are large, they're not going to be filtered because this is a sieve on a microscopic scale, but proteins are big molecules. So the larger protein molecules, especially like the albumin in the plasma, is not going to be filtered through. That's going to be retained in the blood. And the proteins generate oncotic pressure. Now the oncotic pressure is the proportion of the total osmotic pressure generated by the large plasma protein molecules. So there's going to be this oncotic pressure also sucking in. And that works out at about 30 millimetres of mercury. The actual oncotic pressure is going to vary again depending on the part of the gemellulus under consideration. The more water that's extruded out, the more concentrated the proteins will become, the higher the oncotic pressure would be. So what we see is we have 55 millimetres pushing out and a total of 45 opposing that. So that means there's a net filtration pressure of 10 millimetres of mercury. So 10 millimetres of mercury pressure resulting in the formation of glomerular filtrate. Now, we've already noticed on previous videos that about 22% of cardiac output goes through the kidneys. So the kidneys have a large blood supply. And this filtration process is going on in about a million nephrons in each kidney. So in each kidney, you're going to have about a million of these units. And what that adds up to is about 125 mils per minute. And that's described as the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate. So if you're a young fit man watching this video, you're probably producing about 125 mils of glomerular filtrate per minute. That adds up to about 180 litres of glomerular filtrate being produced per day. So this glomerular filtration is going on via the process of ultrafiltration. It's almost as if there's lots of really small gaps here in these capillaries. meaning that the small molecules can fit through, but the larger molecules are going to be retained in the plasma. This process of ultrafiltration. So let's think about some of the components of the blood and think about what enters the glomerular filtrate and what is retained in the capillaries of the glomerulus going into the efferent arteriole. So thinking about some components of the blood. And the basis for filtration is primarily molecular size. So if you think about what's in the blood, well, there's going to be red cells. There's going to be white cells. And there's going to be platelets. Now the red cells, the white cells, and the thrombocytes, the cellular components of the blood, are all way too large to fit through. So they're going to be retained in the blood.
and will go into the efferent arterial. Now I've already said the large proteins the large proteins and fats will also be retained in the blood in the capillaries. Smaller proteins can actually filter through. But what that means is the glomerular filtrate I'm just going to colour in where the glomerular filtrate is now because it gets a bit confusing. It's collected in the Bowman space here and the glomerular filtrate is going to go down into the proximal tubule. So this filtrate will contain no cellular components and essentially no protein and fat, although tiny bits of protein can sometimes get through. But then there's lots of other components in the plasma that you can probably think of as well. For example, there's amino acids. There's uh, glucose. There are vitamins. These are much smaller components. So these are going to be freely filtered from the blood in the capillaries through to the glomerular space. And of course there's going to be the electrolytes. There's going to be sodium. There's going to be potassium, chloride, ions. There's going to be bicarbonate ions. And indeed there's going to be some hydrogen ions as well. And calcium. And because these are small, they're going to be freely filtered. Therefore, they're going to be present in the glomerular filtrate. And there's also going to be waste products present, such as urea. Creatinine is going to be present. And again, relatively small molecules, they're going to be freely filtered into the glomerular filtrate. So what we see is happening is there is a physical sieving of the blood based on molecular size. Larger molecules being retained in the capillaries, smaller molecules being filtered through. So retained, all the cellular components, the large proteins and fats, they're going to be retained. Freely filtering amino acids, glucose, vitamins, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, hydrogen, calcium, ions, and waste products such as urea and creatinine are going to be filtered through. So that's the process of the formation of glomerular filtrate. And of course, of course, water. Small molecule freely filtered into glomerular filtrate to the tune of 180 litres a day, in fact, 125 mils a minute, normal glomerular filtration rate in a healthy young adult. Now, the next part of the story is that all of, these, all of this material, once it's been filtered, once it's been sieved, this process of ultrafiltration, it's all going to go into the tube of the nephron. And here, in the tube of the nephron, selective reabsorption is going to take place. So of all the things that are filtered, the amino acids we want to reabsorb. So all of the amino acids will be reabsorbed after the ultrafiltration in the renal tubule. The glucose all will be reabsorbed. And this is important because healthy urine contains no amino acids, no proteins, no glucose in healthy urine. Most of the vitamins will be reabsorbed, but having said that, if you take a lot of vitamin C, for example, excess amounts will be excreted in the urine because it's highly water-soluble. 
The ions will be reabsorbed, the electrolytes and the ions. <coughs> the urea, actually, do we want urea? Is that useful? Not particularly, but some will be reabsorbed by simple diffusion. But the creatinine is effectively eliminated and none of that will be reabsorbed. And of course, the really clever thing is that the body completely reabsorbs the things that it needs, like the amino acids and the glucose. It gets rid of the creatinine, which is a waste product of muscle metabolism that it doesn't need. And for the rest, it osmotically reabsorbs exactly what it wants. So if you drink a lot of water, you need to excrete more water, so less will be reabsorbed. And it's the same for the ions. If you eat three or four bananas, that's going to increase the amount of potassium in the blood. Less will be reabsorbed from the tubules. Therefore, more will be excreted in the urine so we can maintain homeostasis. So the next part of the story that we'll do now is the tubular part. But this is the ultrafiltration part, basically on grounds of molecular size. Now, the next thing I want to do is look at how this ultrafiltration takes place. And, and that's the topic of the next clip.